All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We are at uh, 1.30, so I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, thank you for coming to the Quantum Speaker Series um, with ATARC. I am Allison Schwartz. I'm the industry co-chair of the Quantum Working Group, uh, along with my co-chairs, uh, Lily Chen at NIST and Terrell Franz. And we're excited to have uh, Ta Tom Levinsky here uh, as a speaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Tom. He has been the he has been employed as Chief Software Architect since 2016 at Quantum Circuits, overseeing key developments in software architecture related to its advanced quantum computing control systems. He's been intricately involved in the development and compilation of quantum algorithms and benchmarks, and uh, he has been a founding member of the QEDC standards and Performance Metrics Technical Advisory Committee and continues to serve as the committee's vice chair, leading efforts to develop application-oriented performance benchmarks for quantum computers. He is also the latest award winner of the Carl Williams Award from QEDC. And with that, we are so excited to have you, Tom, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Allison, for inviting me and having me here today. Um, why don't I go ahead and get started in the interest of everyone's time here. I will uh, share my screen. Uh, let's see. I will do that, and then I will start my presentation. Looks great. Okay. So I was asked here to uh, talk a bit about some of the work that uh, we have been doing um, within the uh, the QEDC, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, uh, on, on benchmarking. Um, we've had a particular focus on benchmarks that are related to uh, the use of applications as a way to gauge what a computer is capable of doing. As you all know, there's lots of other types of benchmarks out there um, at the component level. Uh, but when we when I got involved in the in the standards committee at the at the QEDC, we uh, we talked, the group talked about what what is it that we could explore that might help advance uh, economic development within this, this community. And we saw an opportunity to surface some uh, some example use cases of how, how quantum computers um, run algorithms and how they perform as a result. We, so this was basically an opportunity that that we saw. And then we started this probably four years ago, uh, this project, and it's been evolving ever since. And I'm going to share with you today some of the latest uh, developments and some of the uh, thinking that we've gone through over the years. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started here. Let's see. Yeah. So um, I do want to say that a lot of what I'm going to present here today is is the integration of a lot of perspectives. This isn't just you know my thoughts. Uh, it it's uh, it's come from several years of working with multiple QEDC member companies. A lot of really sharp people contributing to this project, and I believe we have something that has been valuable uh, as a result. So just a quick overview. I don't know how many of you know. Um, the QEDC, uh, the, the Economic Development Consortium. This was initiated in 2018 you know, by the government um, as part of the National Strategic Overview of uh, Quantum Information Science. And the goal was, was basically to uh, encourage and facilitate quantum research and development to help grow the emerging industry. And as part of that, they came up with these, um, they organized it in terms of uh, various uh, committees you know some committees were studying quantum use cases for not only computing but other technologies as well uh, enabling technologies law security and the one that i became involved in the standards and performance metrics uh, and the goal of all of these tasks is to look at ways that that we can facilitate economic development uh, and help the community grow so the goal of the standards tech was in particular to study standards and not only standards but metrics and benchmarks and so on and um, I, I ended up becoming the uh, chairman of that committee and we organized some groups we initially had probably 10 people in our group but it's since then grown to over 100 
uh, with many, many active members. Um, and we, want, we, we, we basically set out to study how can we, uh, how can standards and development or uh, standards and performance metrics assist in uh, encouraging development. And we had uh, within our group, um, uh, a couple different projects going on in parallel, right? There was a primary group that was focused on the landscape, the ecosystem. There was a quantum sensing group, networking group. And then this quantum computing group was one area. It turned out a lot of people in the QDC were interested in quantum computing. All these other things as well. But there was a very large number of people interested in quantum computing. And so we... Um, we took a look at that and started investigating what can we do, and we came up with a couple of projects here. We we, we looked at uh, developing application-focused benchmarks, and I'll talk a little bit about why we chose that. There was also some work done on intermediate. looked at the landscape for uh, quantum computing, we saw a lot of projects out there, right? There's IEEE, IEC, industry things like quantum volume, CLOPS. There's a lot of research uh, projects going on, randomized benchmarking. Uh, in particular, this one here, volumetric benchmarks, the work being that was done at uh, Sandia a few years ago really caught our attention. Lots of smaller ad hoc projects. So we saw that there was a lot going on out there. And we tried to figure out, well, where's the gap? What could we, what could we do? Uh, and we also found that um, it's, a, it's actually, the work being done is actually relatively sparse. There were a couple of IEEE projects that were launched that, you know, they didn't produce um, too much yet. Um, and one of them was about uh, uh, terminology that that actually produced some output there was some discussion uh, in the quantum initiative about identifying benchmarks we actually built on some of those initial meetings and thoughts and decided let's within this consortium do something concrete and what we talked about and what we identified here was there with there was a gap uh, i call it the provider user gap um, what happens what we saw happening was that the manufacturers of the quantum computing devices, the uh, providers, uh, offer a lot of information about the machine's characteristics, right? The implementation, the fidelity of one and two qubit gates. You see a lot of information about, you know, error uh, uh, rates and timing information. And we did see things like quantum volume, which is very valuable as a measure of what a computer overall is capable of doing. But for an application developer, these metrics are difficult to translate into an understanding of what the machine can actually do. This information is valuable and meaningful for a technologist who's deep in it. But if you're writing an application, there are other things you want to know. Uh, and particularly users who are in fields that are not directly related to quantum they want to use a quantum computer. They want to explore how to use a quantum computer. They want to know different kinds of things. It's all about the algorithms. You know, if you run an algorithm of this big and how many qubits are you going to use and how rapidly does do your res results degrade, there's all these algorithm-related questions that surface once you start looking at it from a user perspective. How much is it going to cost me to run? You know, and if I if I see that I have a fidelity on my one qubit gate or I have a collapse number, it really doesn't tell me, is this going to take me a minute of time or an hour of time? I can't tell. So these are the questions that surfaced, and we wanted to address those. And it's just not possible from these low-level metrics to obtain answers. So then we looked at some of the existing application benchmarks out there, and there are a lot of them, right? Uh, many of you probably have seen some of these, and they all have valuable uh, you know, things to offer, um, but each one of them is so somewhat, you know, limited uh, in their scope. Maybe attempting to be more broad. Uh, what we found is that um, they need work. They all need work, 
And we took a, a look at all of these and we thought, well, is there something that we can do that maybe makes it more readily available to people? Um, from a user perspective, we want to, what we really want to do is we wanted to make it available to them to be able to uh, just run these programs and uh, and they get results and it just works. Uh, <clears throat> and so what we did is we decided let's let's set up a framework uh, in which you can run many of these algorithms and perform some measurements, basically run them as benchmarks. And we Within this framework, we developed a mechanism for sweeping over a range of different problem sizes. We systematized the collection of metrics and computation of a number of different uh, performance metrics. So basically the focus was on a framework that can produce reports and visuals. And the idea here is that instead of forcing users, if a user knows they have a particular algorithm they wanna run, rather than forcing them to go build in all of the measurement metrics and capabilities, we're doing the work for them. And so we ended up providing a repository, a collection of a whole lot of vetted algorithms that we spent years working on and polishing and optimizing them so that they work well as benchmarks. And that was how the project was initiated. So um, the result initially, this is some of our initial results. Many of you may have seen the papers that we have put out. There's a couple of papers, I'll mention those in a bit, but the work that we ended up doing in the beginning was, you see here two examples. We, we took a, a quantum phase estimation algorithm on 12 qubits, a Grover search algorithm. And you can see the x-axis at the bottom over here is just the number of qubits, the size of the problem. And then we have a number of metrics, the fidelity, you can see it as the number of qubits grows, the quality of result that comes out of the circuit goes down. And then very interesting observations you can make here, a phase estimation algorithm, obviously doesn't, it can run on 12 you know, uh, qubits, maybe up to, you get about 50%, up to about seven qubits. On a simulator, this is on a quantum simulator, these are run. Um, with some specific noise measurements. Uh, and so that framework took these measurements and then we presented them. Then what we did, this is where it got really interesting, is we really liked the work that uh, Robin Bloom Cahoot, Kevin Young, and Tim uh, Proctor at Sandia had developed this volumetric uh, benchmarking project. And um, they had come up with a mechanism by which um, they extended this concept of quantum volume. If you think of quantum volume as a square region, this is a log axis here measuring, uh, showing the uh, transpiled circuit depth. Uh, these little boxes represent the quantum volume uh, measurements. And so you can see here that uh, quantum volume characterizes a region in the depth and width uh, grid. Uh, in other words, if my circuit gets deeper, I I can't, um, I can't have as many qubits involved. If I want more qubits, I can't make my circuit as deep. So there's this, you know, volume area here that was captured by quantum volume. The Sandia people extended that and created this idea of uh, volumetric benchmarks. And so they came up with ways to measure uh, across this entire range, not just within the quantum volume region the performance of a computer. And what, what we did in our group is we came up with this idea that the different algorithms, like here you see phase estimation, and over here you see Grover's, the algorithms generate a profile, an application profile that shows you where, where uh, on this grid of width and depth does that algorithm perform? You know, um, where does it execute? So phase estimation, doesn't make as deep a circuit and you can do it on more qubits and still get reasonable fidelity. The Grover search is much deeper circuit. It, it contains much deeper circuits for you know, smaller widths. And notice here that when we ran our benchmarks and aligned it with the techniques of this volumetric uh, positioning um, approach, this quantum volume rectangle here, the, the circuits 
for these applications that fit within that rectangle show higher quality around 0.6 or more that represent the volume in which a computer can execute those algorithms. Tom, so was, we, we have a question um, in the Q&A uh, about okay. the different platforms that were used. Um, was it IBM, IIQ, D-Wave, others? Uh, the question was from an anonymous attendee. Yes, I have those charts coming up. Uh, Perfect. I have those plots coming up. This right here, to be clear, these are uh, these algorithms just run on a quantum simulator that has configured its noise to have a quantum volume of 32. Okay, we actually ran the quantum volume protocol on that noise model. And what is astounding, I thought, when we did this project was how well these benchmark algorithms line up with the notion of quantum volume. But what the algorithms do is they give you a way of examining the profile uh, of these algorithms, because all the ones we have have a very different profile, as you'll see. So I'll, I'll move on. Um, oops. Let's see. For some reason, my key isn't working. Uh, yeah. So right here. So these are the algorithms that we developed. Uh, we and we what we found is that there was a lot there were a lot of tutorials available in Kiskit. There was some available in Circ bracket. We drew on whatever resources we could, and these are this is the current status of the benchmarks. We're in the process of developing a few of these on some of these other environments. Here we have for reference uh, these two papers. We did a paper in 2021 that covered all of the initial benchmarks, the volumetric approach that we took, uh, 13 of these initial, or I think it was 11 initial benchmarks. And then last year, we dug into execution time as another important metric. We tested it on various simulators. We tested it on various kinds of hardware. So here, one of the interesting things we did is we said, okay, let's explore all of the algorithms. And notice here that, I, don't, I, hope, I hope you can see it on the screen, it's rather small, but this is all talked about in that first paper. Um, this is a collection of all the algorithms uh, on a simulator running at a quantum volume of 32. And you can see here that, um, now one of the things that was interesting was this quantum volume region works well for the square area, but notice how these algorithms, these very short but wide algorithms perform well outside the quantum volume region. This was one of the first observations that, and that's because quantum volume is, is taking into account the notion of connectivity. And in a simulator, there's no degradation due to connectivity. So these wider circuits actually perform better. That was one observation. Then we extended it and we said, let's reduce the noise in our simulator and let's put it up to 2048. And you can see here, clearly better results. All again, everything that's green fits nicely within that quantum volume region. So we took this as some uh, validation that the algorithms, the measurement of the fidelity, the calculation that we're doing for the fidelity within the algorithms was constructed in a way that was consistent with other types of benchmarks. And that's what we saw from these uh, experiments on the simulator. So then we went ahead and ran it on some different hardware. And you know, this is two years ago. Some of these machines like this IBM Casablanca machine don't even exist anymore. They were retired. Uh, we ran it on IonQ. Uh, and we also ran it on the Continuum, one of their first machines. And you can see different results, but these machines you can't really directly compare because they're they all have different levels uh in their release every every one of these vendors has newer machines that perform differently but this just illustrates that we were able to run the benchmarks on all of these now uh oh i'm conscious of running low on time here wow okay so um why benchmarking? Let's just talk a little bit about this, and I'll talk a little bit more about where we're going with all of it. So uh, why the focus on benchmarking? Um, a lot of, we, we saw a lot of value in having this for the users. Uh, one of the key things from my perspective 
is that by having these benchmarks, you're provide and running them on all these different hardware, you're providing some validation across the different providers in industry that quantum computing is real. You can run it on different platforms. Here are some measurable metrics. It looks more real when you can surface to users something that you can do and actually measure for yourself. Uh, this helps to build credibility so that investors go, well, this is starting to look good. It's evolving. And every year I can see the benchmarks are getting better. So th these are some of the important reasons why we thought it was important. Um, I also myself viewed this really as a, as a platform for exploration. Once you understand how the benchmark framework works and you can work within the framework, it's easy to develop new ones. It, particularly this green item here, uh, how do algorithms and applications scale? This is really important because that profile how they scale as they get larger and they try to solve bigger and bigger problems is really important to understand. Again, with the idea of giving people some confidence in how quantum computing works. We have this framework. It's basically a bunch of algorithms. There's a, a module for doing all the metrics collection. There's a manager of execution that can direct it to different targets. Uh, we also, uh, in last summer, we expanded this to not only include gate model machines, the framework that we provided allows us to um, work on other types of hardware. And this is one of the areas that we're looking at now. Um, currently, our projects involve performance using third-party tools. Are there various ways that you can improve performance using software tools, uh, error mitigation tools, for example, or uh, compiler optimizations? We're developing a whole series of new benchmarks. Uh, there's a, right now this summer we have in the QEDC has brought in several interns. Um, I think we have now uh, four different interns working on several of these projects. We have a hydrogen lattice simulation now. Last summer we did this max cut combinatorial optimization. These are these first two are particularly important because they are iterative and they execute the circuits over and over again, using an, a classical optimizer to perform um, some uh, convergence on some answer. And so the, these are important because the execution time, there's a significant trade-off between execution time and quality of result you can get. So a lot of the focus last year and again this year is on execution time. Um, and how, how much is it going to cost me as a user to actually solve this problem with a quantum computer? We have a uh, HHL. I don't know if some of you may be familiar with the linear solver um, uh, algorithm. This is, um, we, we, we developed a highly scalable version of HHL, which is uh, extremely useful for people. And now we're doing a machine learning benchmark as well that does image classification. So there's a lot of work going on to enhance these benchmarks right now. We're also looking to expand to new hardware platforms, looking at ad uh, uh, cold atom uh, computing, photonic computing. The framework we believe is extensible enough to actually address all these different platforms. Recently last summer, or uh, actually just this summer, one of the interns was able to adapt it now to take advantage of the uh, the sampler and the sessions capability in Qiskit runtime, which has been, that's, that's a great improvement that they put in. Uh, Tom, we have an interesting question um, in the okay. Q&A. Uh, okay. It's kind of the uh, the holy grail, which is um, how would we know when quantum is better than classical computing? Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I would say that right now we're a little early on that because uh, developing the, this framework as a way to simply, we get two things out of it, I see, uh, beyond just what I said earlier about um, explore a, a platform for exploration. Concretely, we get the ability to actually run the same algorithm easily on different platforms, uh, quantum platforms. So you're comparing quantum to quantum. We, we also have the ability for the quantum providers to see how they're computers are getting better over the years. These are very valuable during this early stage. When we ran on D-Wave, which I will show you in just a minute, um, the D, so let's, let's talk about hybrid algorithms. Um, uh, classical solutions are much better right now than quantum. 
quantum is early, building out the framework so that we're able to define a problem in a way that can be run across different uh, on different platforms. We have the gate model computers. We have the annealing machine now that we're able to run. We'll have other types of computers. And as long as you can execute that same problem using a classical solution, which you can do within the framework, although we haven't done that because the classical blows it out of the water, I mean, honestly, um, building out the framework so it's capable of comparing the classical and the quantum is what that is the longer term goal. This project is going to go on for years. Uh, we started it. It's already been three years. It's maturing. We're getting a lot of traction, a lot of people beginning to see value in it. Um, and so, as I mentioned here, hybrid algorithms are important because right now, hybrid algorithms are often the algorithms that are used to compare against classical for optimization, for example. So right here, the Quawa. So in gate model computing, we did Quawa. We, we did a max cut benchmark. And this is an interesting variation where uh, on our um, the uh, plots that we produce, when you run a circuit iteratively, in this case, each one of these bars going across, each one of these rectangles represents an iteration of the compute of the circuit and the time it takes. So the the horizontal axis is the total time it's taking to solve the problem out with 12 variables, in this case, 12, one variable for each qubit. And so you can see that these charts are showing you, they're giving you a view into the trade-off between how long do I have to let my algorithm run before I get a good enough quality answer? That's how Quawa works. Now, we did that on the simulator. We did it on, uh, we also did this on various hardware devices. So we have, we did this on IBM. Uh, Guadalupe machine. We did it on an IonQ machine. Again, these are somewhat older machines. And we did it on a, a D-Wave Advantage system. And if you look at the execution time numbers here, you're seeing gate model is on the order of 140 seconds to get a green result on four qubits. Uh, here we have 400 on an ION computer. If you look at the D-Wave, it's a second to get a decent on many more qubits. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that annealing is really good at optimization problems, combinatory opt optimization. So one of the things we're doing this summer is we're extending this same exact framework to also measure the VQE, which for quantum chemistry is, is something that has similar but slightly different and a little bit more involved characteristics. And so as we explore more algorithms on gate model, uh, these, you know, these numbers are going to be important and uh, certain kinds of computing will be able to address them. And then if the problem is defined in a way that you can run it on different kinds of machines and classical, then ideally that would eventually give us a way to compare against the classical once the quantum computers are far enough along. Gate model machines have a lot of work to do right now on reducing this execution time. There's a lot of setup and initialization time that goes in here. That'll all get better over time. I'm certain of it. So we learned a lot in this project. Uh, we're getting a high level of adoption. Um, many things were successful. Extensibility validated. It, providers have really taken this up as a way to you know, see their improvements but we're also very much in the early stages. Execution time really needs to be studied more. Iterative algorithms need to be studied more and we need to extend to more platforms. Um, scaling to larger problem sizes, how do you even know? Like, theoretically, the quantum computer can uh, have an exponential advantage over a classical. And so at some point, the classical problems, you can't validate that you know what the answer is. We're not there yet. We're still at the stage where most of the problems can be classically solved and we can uh, know what the answer is. Um, anticipating new hardware. Will there be new kinds of hardware that emerge that we haven't even thought of yet? Do we have to change how the benchmarks are developed? So far, we've been able to address a lot of different challenges in that area. 
Uh, and then fault tolerance, you know, as error correction comes into play, how is that going to affect it? These are all questions that we haven't really addressed fully yet. Um, a lot of takeaways, you know, as I mentioned, the platform for exploration. Uh, we, we've tried to foc you know, really focus our efforts on something. We're, we're trying again to put uh, this summer to put out another paper, a third paper that will document the work we're doing. Um, and uh, I would say that for the community, uh, a lot of recommendations I would make. Number one, we want to avoid fragmentation. I think we should try to bring together benchmarking projects so that we're not just all over the place and the user has to decide uh, amongst you know 26 different benchmarks. Uh, the more we can um, agree on the right way to measure things, the better. And I, we need people to contribute. Um, the, the QEDC, a lot of members, I'm sure in this meeting here, belong to the QEDC, and uh, this group is open to any contribution. Our entire project is open source, so you can, you know, even if you're not part of QEDC, you can contribute. And we want to make sure that we really manage this properly. It has to be, you know, it has to be uh, managed. So. I think I'm out of time right now. So um... you are, Tom, but thank you so much. There is one last question that um, I just want to pose to you um, at the end. Chris Wood uh, asked if there is a way you can extrapolate what newer machines or more qubits might mean uh, for these results, or is that what you guys are taking on next? Um, um, can you say that last part of that question again? I'm not sure I understood. Sure. The question was, as you continue to use newer machines with more qubits or technology, can you extrapolate what these results will be for continuity? Well, in some sense, yes, but obviously there are many factors that that uh, come into play because of the profile for a particular application. You know, clearly you can you, know, you can extrapolate how an application might perform with more qubits. You can look at the charts and make some extrapolations. However. A lot of uh, surprising factors come into play. Um, you know, you have your crosstalk between qubits. You have, um, you know, various uh, scaling factors that come in. I I'm aware of many research uh, projects. I don't know if some of you have seen the quantum uh, tortoise and the classical ha uh, hair uh, presentation by um, uh, MIT, but they are doing some work on uh, exactly that, analyzing as computers uh, become more capable, at what point will we be able to be better than classical? Uh, there are lots of projects going on in that area. Um, uh, Neil Thompson, uh, he, he's made a presentation about that. Um, so yes, it is theoretically possible, but I have concerns about factors that we haven't really uncovered yet that might impact it. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, we would love to see you at future uh, ATAR speaker series, as well as part of the ATAR Quantum Working Group. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom, and have a wonderful day.